May God bless you. Today, we will finally finish the 23rd chapter of the book of Samuel. And as a theme, we are going to call this study the time of the reward. And we are going to read just a few verses in verse 8, just one verse for now. And it says, we are going to begin here until we end in verse 39. And the word of the Lord says, These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. And he begins there to number them. And so with this heading, David's mighty men, verse 8 begins. And beloved, David began with 600 mighty men known as the mighty men but amongst that 600 in the last verses of chapter 23 it mentions 37 out of those 600 valiant men that out that outstood because of something that they did or a mighty work that they did and so it is a honorific mention or a special distinction that david attributes to these men and in verse 8 it begins with the names of the mighty men whom David had. The first one who is named is the chief among the captains by the name of Josheb Basehebeth, and he killed 800 men on that occasion. Then it says that Eliezer, the son of Dodo, was there when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel had retreated. In verse 9, it says that it was an impressive, impressive feat. And it was a man who arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord, the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to plunder. And how beautiful it is for that sword of the Spirit, that double-edged sword, could stick to our hands until we can finish the armies of the enemies off. This other one, in verse 11, after him was a Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite, the Philistine had gathered into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field and defended it and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. And so this means or can represent when we guard the word of the Lord that God has given us and how beautiful it is when we stand our ground and defend the word of the Lord that God has given to us. And so this man stood and he defended that field. And in verse 13, there are three men who heard. And these were the three of the 30 chief men. They heard David saying with vehemence. And they said, and David said with longing in verse 15, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. And so this feat was considered so great. And we see that throughout this whole um, passage that there is no comparison to what they did because they exposed their own lives to the degree that David would not drink it because he valued it very, he valued it as he valued the life of his men. And so he poured it out to the Lord as an offering. And beloved, brothers and sisters and friends, everything that we do for the Lord will be of great value when we do it to fulfill the desire of our beloved Jesus. Now the question fits here. What is the greatest desire of the Lord Jesus? His greatest desire is for us to draw waters out of the waters of life and to share those waters with the thirsty souls and those living waters 
to be drawn out to share with a thirsty humanity. It will be like waters pour, poured out before the Lord. And in verse 18, it says, Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief of another three. He lifted his spear against 300 men, killed them, and won a name among these three. Notice, they're all mighty men, but there will always be some who give more, who go that extra mile. And so these were mighty men, but none of them surpassed the first three mighty men. And who were these three mighty men? The ones who pleased the king. In verse 20, it says, Benaiah was the son of Jehoadiah, the son of a valiant man from Caspiel, who had done many deeds. What is a valiant man? Someone who does an extra effort. And it says here, he was a valiant man. And it says that he did great deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. And he also had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. So notice that that is an extra effort, a greater effort, a greater problem uh, to move with agility um, on the occasion that he fought. And in verse 21, it says, well, right before that, it says he had also gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. So extra effort because it was a snowy day. Verse 21, and he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand. So he went down to him with a staff, rested in the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. So these things Benaiah, the son of Jehodiah, did and won a name among the three mighty men. He was more honored than the thirty, but he did not attain to the first three. And in verse 24, Ash Azael, the brother of Joab, was one of the thirty. Elnahan, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem. 25, Shammah, the Herodite. Elika, the Herodite. Helis, the Peltite. Ira, the son of Ikesh, the Keoite, the Tikoite. Verse 27, Abiezer, the Anatothite, the Mebunai, the Hushathite. Verse 28, it says, Zalman and Aohitite, Meharai, the Nephilite, Heleb, the son of Bana. And in verse 30, it says, Benaiah, a Pyrothonite, he died from the brooks of Gash, Abi, Elbon, the Erbethite, Asmabeth, the Bahumite. In verse 32, Eliahaba, the Shalbonite of the sons of Jeshin. And in verse 33, we have Shama, the Herarite, Ahiam, the son of Sharar, the Herarite. And in verse 34, we find Eliphalet, the son of Ahashbai, the son of Makathite, Eliam, the son of Ahitophel. And as we notice, all we see is mentioned their names, and some of them mentions their fathers or the region where they came from. But let's notice this last one that we just read, which was Eliam in verse 34. He is the father of Bathsheba, the woman who David took in adultery. And this is the sin that God forgave David in base, based on his confession and his repentance, which was a genuine repentance. God forgave not only his sin, but he forgave his own life since there was a sentence of death against David. But Ahitophel, the grandfather of Bathsheba, did not forgive. And Ahitophel had been for David his intimate, his friend, his advisor, his counselor. Now Ahitophel unites himself to the rebellion of Absalom, to resentful ones who want to end with the life of David, to resentful ones who divide David's kingdom. Ahitophel ends by hanging himself and that is how his life ends when he could have ended his race when he could have ended his life with the same honor that Eliam his son ends up with the lack of forgiveness brothers and sisters in Christ 
can make us lose the honorable position amongst the mighty ones and lose it all. In verse 35, in continuance with the list of the valiant ones, Hezrai the Carmelite, Pararai the Arabite, Egal the son of Nathan, and in verse 37, there is Selig the Ammonite, Naharai the Barothite, and in verse 38, we find Ira the Ithrite, and we also find Gareb the Ithrite. And in verse 39, we have none other than Uriah the Hittite, the most faithful man of all, that in the days when David sinned, he brought him to the palace to cover up his sin. And this Uriah did not want to go to his house, though David was sending him off to his home to be with his wife so that he can attribute the son that Bathsheba was pregnant with, which was the consequence of the adultery of David and thereby covering his sin up. But Uriah did not want to leave the palace to protect his king. And so when that plan failed, for him to go home and sleep with his wife, he makes him drunk so that he could lose his senses, so that he could go to his home. But once again, the faithfulness of Uriah was much stronger than the desire to be with his own woman. And lastly, he sends him off with a letter where the sentence of Uriah's death was written. The Bible tells us, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of eternal life. Because of his faithfulness to his king, he is on the list of the most outstanding men, crowned not with a corruptible crown, not with a crown of laurels, not with any trophy, not with any reward or position, but he was crowned with the crown of eternal life. Faithfulness is the greatest feat that we can present ourselves before our king who is a just king let's remember that david had already gone through all of the discipline of god he suffered the consequences for this sin but he always remained faithful faithful to god trusting in the forgiveness of his sins and living with an unbreakable faith with a spirit that was surrendered which was expressed in every one of the psalms that he wrote and so David is finishing his race. And chapter 23 were the last words of David. David is ready to stand before God with clean hands and with a righteous heart. The question for us, for you and for me, is are we ready to stand in front of our God? There are two there are two um, thrones which we are going to stand in front of. The first one is the throne or the judgment seat of Christ. And we are going to read what is going to be judged in that throne. And you can go before that throne or maybe you decide to go before the other throne which is the judgment of the white throne which that is how it is known so let's go to second corinthians 5:10 and it says for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The judgment seat of Christ is the time of the manifestation and of the reward. In other words, it is going to be manifest in front of him and in front of us and in front of everybody who is in that throne our works are going to be manifested what we did is going to manifest and it says whether it's good or bad and there are going to be many faces with shame 
and it says that that judgment seat um, and be encouraged it's not for condemnation since the merits or because of the merits of Christ we have been justified we have been we have been declared without fault and so this this judgment is going to be to prove our works but our works are going to be tested by fire can you understand this what we did is going to be tested by fire and it will be revealed and we can have losses in this judgment or we can have rewards in the book of revelation 21 verse 7 it says and he who overcomes shall inherit all things and i will be his god and he shall be my son and there is a verse in the book of romans as well and i would like for us to go there in chapter 14 which speaks to us about this judgment seat verse 10 and it says but why do you judge your brother or why do you show contempt for your brother for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, the only judge whom we are going to stand before is Christ. And it says all, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Notice it says brother. Like I once again clear up for you that in this judgment it is only going to be the sons the daughters of god who are the sons and daughters of god i hear this a lot everybody's a child of god but john in chapter 1 verse 11 tells me that we are not all sons and daughters of god only the ones who have received him and so the one who has received christ the scripture says they are given the authority to be made children of God. And so let's look at that with clarity because if you have not received Christ, if Christ is not your Savior, if you have not gotten a hold of the benefits of the death and resurrection of Christ and you are not living according to His will, you are a creature, a creation of God but you cannot be a child of God, a son or daughter, until we are adopted into his family. The Father has only one, his only begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ, but he has a lot of children through adoption, by adoption through Christ. And you can find that scripture and realize that we are not all sons and daughters or not all are sons and daughters uh, but yes if you do not have Christ you are a creature a creation of God and so here um, so David makes stand out the work of the valiant men I'm gonna go back really quick and I want to take you back to the other judgment and this one is called the judgment of the great white throne and in order for, for us to understand this, I want to make a note that amongst the list of all the mighty men, if you notice that Joab, which was one of his, his generals or his general, he was always next to David. He fought many battles, but at the end, Joab is not found on the list of the 37 outstanding valiant men of David. Why? The only thing that we see in this list on verse 23 is that Joab is mentioned in verse 24, but look at the manner that he is mentioned in. He is mentioned, it says in 2 Samuel 23:24, And so it, it says right here, as Shale, the brother of Joab, he was mentioned as the brother of uh, of Ashael, but not as a valiant man himself. And in verse 23, 37, it says, Zelek the Ammonite, Nahari the Berothite, armor bearer of Joab, the son of Zeruiah. So he's not mentioned in an honorific way. And even though he was faithful, 
uh, but he, there was a lot of self-interest in his work and so Joab dies without honor what was the reason he was very independent he not always consulted with the king he did a lot of good things for the kingdom but he also in those good things he sought his own benefit when David is dying he goes on to be part of the rebellion of Adonijah as if he was saying well David's gonna die uh, I'm gonna go and uh, with my experience let's see what advantage I can get out of the new king but David before he died he commends him to Solomon and we're gonna find this in first Kings chapter 2 and um, we've read it before but it fits in this study once again and in verse 5 it says moreover and this is David speaking with Solomon moreover you know also what Joab the son of Zeruiah did to me and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel to Abner the son of Ner and Amasa the son of Jether whom he killed and he shed the blood of war in peacetime and so he killed him as a vengeance it was a personal thing he had he uh, thought that the kingdom was in danger but maybe it was because he thought his position was in danger and so he says well Amasa came and united himself to David he's another general and so he exposed the kingdom a lot because of his own desires and so David commends him to Solomon and Solomon judged him for being unloyal and his loss was great he lost his life and he stopped being part of a kingdom of peace he could have been part of that glorious kingdom of Solomon a prosperous kingdom a kingdom of prosperity and peace in the judgment seat of Christ we don't lose eternal life but we do lose our rewards when our work is passed through the fire and if it gets burned it's going to be revealed that it was not to honor the king, but it was for our own benefit, for our own exaltation, so that people see who we are and what we do. That work is going to be burned. That is why the work of Joab was burned. He did a lot, very much so. But there was personal interest. Therefore, he lost. He lost his life. He lost the reward. He lost everything. And the second judgment seat is the great white throne. It's where the Lord is going to judge the ungodly. And there in the same, uh, in Second Samuel, I'm going to go back to Second Samuel 23, verse 6. And it says, um, but the sons of rebellion shall be all as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands so an ungodly person is someone who does not respect God they don't respect God's law and so in Revelation if we go to the book of Revelation 21 verse 8 there is a list and it says but the cowardly the unbelieving the ab abominable murderers sexually immoral sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, no such thing as a small or a big lie, they all shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. These are the ones who are going to stand in the judgment of the great white throne that is described in Revelation verse chapter 20, verse 11, and I'm going to read it and this is really important for us to know that there is only two ways and there is only two judgments and so in chapter 20 verse 11 it says then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great standing before God and books were opened and another book which was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged 
according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Where Satan and his demons will be and all of the ungodly will be. They will be torn out to be burned in the fire. Verse 15, meditate on it. And, and, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When that adoption comes, when we accept Christ, we accept salvation, it's not because of our works or good works. Then He, uh, through Himself, an adoption is operated. And every adoption has a register. Here on this earth, when humanly there is an adoption they record a certificate where it it is recorded who the adoptive parents are and the name of that child there is a book in the kingdom of heaven which is known as the book of life and it says here and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire so there are records in heaven there are records of our good works and just like there are records of our works that put us to shame i remember um one of the retreats that i went to go minister we met an older woman and a group of the church went with me over there near visalia and this uh, woman said that she had a dream where the Lord took us or took her to a place of many books and that she said she asked what are these books and they told her these are the books that are in the on the earth and these books are inspired by the Holy Spirit and these are the books that are first written in heaven and she saw another book and and they said she asked what book is this and they answered, this is your book. And she started to go through the book and she asked, why is there pages that have writing and then there's blank pages in between? He said, these are the pages where you committed sin, but we blotted out, blotted out the sin from those pages. Do you see? And in the book of Malachi, in the, the last chapter of Malachi, there is a portion that says that there is the book of Chronicles of God. It's where God has a register, a record of all of us, beloved in Christ. This is serious. This is life or death. For the 37 mighty men of David, there was rewards. But for Joab, for Ahitophel, for Absalom, there was death. And it says that that fire that burns with fire and sulfur is the second death is the eternal condemnation separated from God eternally without any possibility of coming out but in Christ we have life and life eternal there is only one way that can save us to stand before that terrible great white throne there is hope for the sinner. There is hope for us. And that way is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He is the eternal life. He is the only one who can deliver us from living a whole eternity in torment. As we read this in the book of Revelation, in this last verse that we read, uh, Revelation 20 and we began to read uh, from 11 to 15. If you go to verse 10, go a little bit up. It speaks to us about the destiny of Satan, the deceiver, 
the one who offers riches and pleasures, the one who whispers in your ear, have a good time, you're free. He's a deceiver. He deceived Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden by telling them that they were not going to die. And that is the same lie that is spread out throughout the whole world. Oh, nothing's going to happen to you. Oh, this is pleasure. This is joy. But look at his destiny of the much that he offers. Look where he's going to end. Verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. In other words, for all eternity. And so there in verse 11 is when it, we just read it and it is described the great white throne and all of those who were not found in the book of life and how they will be judged. And the plan of God was perfect. As you can realize, the devil is a deceiver and the end of this deceiver is going to be in this lake of fire and brimstone. But he doesn't want to go alone. He continues to deceive so that multitudes will go together with him. He even offers that in the life to come, that he's going to have an eternal party, a party or a celebration of pleasures. But that's not what the scripture says. Because the pleasure of this earth, which what he offered, it is an invitation that is going to end in torment. On the other hand, what the Lord offers is a delight, eternal life. It is things, as the Apostle Paul said, things that no eye have seen or ear has heard that have not even come up into our mind. It is not a place of boredom. It is a pleasurable. It is a place of delight. And it is within your reach. If you only accept Jesus Christ, he already paid the price with his life. He bought us at the price of his blood. He suffered the torments that nobody ever has suffered. All of the torments of hell he felt when he was separated for an instant from his father, which is the most greatest agony that the sinner is going to experiment, that separation from God, eternal separation from God. When they had the opportunity to be in that place of delight, all they had to do was accept the gift of God, which was salvation through Jesus Christ. Come to Christ, beloved. Come to Christ. Listen to his call. This message is a call to you by the Holy Spirit to you. Surrender your life, repent from your sins. And we saw all of David's fault. We're almost finishing. You know, he sinned, he made grave uh, sins of death. Nonetheless, he repented and God forgave him because God wants to forgive us. He wants to forgive your sins. That is the reason why he died on the cross of Calvary for you. And he wants for your name to be written in that book of life. And he went to go prepare for us all of those things that he wants to give to us as a reward. But you know, the greatest reward is to be in his presence. But even with that, he wants to honor us more. And he wants us to stand before him in that judgment seat of Christ. But he doesn't want us to be put to shame. He, he doesn't want for our works to be burned up. That all of the effort that we have made and everything that we have done for the kingdom. You know, like Joab, he did so much. And sadly, he ended up burned. But that our works will not be burned. But that we will be there with expectation of the, of the reward. Because we um, that we will be put to shame he doesn't want that if we did it to get a benefit out of it or to look good in front of people or for self promotion self exaltation to be made ourselves known here on this earth no let us be the most unknown people let our names be unknown on this earth but let our names be written in the book of life so that our reward will not be burned away. We don't know what that reward is. 
Uh, but it's going to be great because even without a reward, it is glory that awaits us. Imagine the rewards in that glory. Don't, don't miss out on it because you want to stand out because of the vain glory, because of pride, because of arrogance. You know, who cares? Let people have us as nobodies, as the most ignorant, uh, but that we will be known before God to be loyal like Uriah was until death and that we will be on that list like Uriah was on that list of the mighty men of David. And so we decide what judgment throne do we want to stand? Do we want to stand before the throne of Christ? Or do we want to go before the great white throne of judgment? And that's for condemnation. Now, today is the day of salvation. Choose wisely, because all of humanity, surely, we will stand before one of these two judgment thrones. May God bless you abundantly, and the desire of my heart is that you, with wisdom, will choose to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But for that, first you have to accept Him, surrender your life, live for Him. That is the best decision. And though the testings and battles come, and though temptation will come, you pressing and holding on to Christ, you will be, we will be more than conquerors, fighting the good fight of faith. May God bless you abundantly is the desire of my heart. Always. Justified fully through Calvary's love Oh, what a standing is mine And the transaction so quick he was made When as a sinner I came Took of the offer of praise he did proffer He saved me, oh, praise his dear name Heaven came down and glory Yeah.